halftime, and after all this gory excitement, you deserve a taste of your own mortality. Try Nurgle King's new pesto burger. Special rotten buns, a juicy nurgling snake, a and blue cheese, and a rotter bile dressing. The decaying taste of Nurgle. Approved by the best Nurgle team. Nurgle King. Mm. Hello everyone, I'm Flick. You probably don't know me, but that's not important right now. Well, this one might seem like it's coming out of nowhere, right? Out of left field, even? I'll try not to do any more sports puns throughout, I promise. Even if you're aware of Blood Bowl 3, created by Cyanide Studios and published by... Nikon? Nason? Whatever, I'll say Nikon from now on, and if that's wrong, who cares? You probably haven't thought much about the game since hearing about the appalling state it launched in on February 23rd of last year. Blood Bowl is based on the tabletop game of the same name created by Games Workshop, of which I am both a player and a fan. I put a fair amount of time into Blood Bowl 2, and despite having some issues with it, I was looking forward to the third outing in the series from Cyanide Studios. Who could have guessed it would go so wrong for them? Or the journey the game's gone on since then? Things will be a bit different for the critique this time around. Normally, I'd like to really get stuck into a story, meet it on its own level, and find what's wrong. I can't do that here, though. After all, this game doesn't really have much of a story within it to speak of, but the story surrounding it, and how, just over one year later, the developers are still pushing on with their project, hoping to see a return on the time and money invested in it, warrants a nice, close look, I feel. I've been collecting some player opinions, grievances and the like, some developer interviews and reactions, and some general analytical data on how the game has been doing in 2024, which also saw the release of its fourth season of content and updates in late March. The video is going to follow the timeline of the game from pre-launch until now, after a brief rundown of the basics for the uninitiated as to what Blood Bowl even is. Keep in mind that everything is split into chapters, so if you're a seasoned Blood Bowl player and don't need a refresher on the game itself or Cyanide Studios' handling of the license, you can use the timestamps below the video in the description to skip ahead. For everyone else though, grab a warm beverage of your choice and then let's get stuck in. Based in an alternative version of the old world of Warhammer that veered off in a completely different direction to the core timeline, Blood Bowl is a world where a half-blind, senile old dwarf found ancient texts speaking of a violent game created by Nuffle, which is NFL misread as a word rather than an acronym. Yep, it's a parody of American football with even more violence than its British counterpart rugby. This version of the old world becomes obsessed with the sport until it becomes the metaphorical backbone of the entire society. There isn't war anymore, everything is settled by and revolves around Blood Bowl. If you want an apt analogy, it's kind of similar how the world of Metalocalypse is completely obsessed with Death Clock and their death metal music. The original tabletop version of Blood Bowl was released in 1986 by Games Workshop with it getting a re-release update in 2016. In 2020, the tabletop was updated to its second season edition. While there has of course been erratas, FAQs, revisions and new teams over the years, the core rules themselves have remained remarkably unchanged, which is usually a good sign that you're onto a potentially timeless game system. I'll spare you rule specifics, but a game of Blood Bowl typically involves two teams of at least 11 players from various Warhammer fantasy races. Humans, dwarves, orcs, elves and dead, vampires, etc and sub-factions as well, competing for the most touchdowns across two halves of 16 turns each, 8 per side. Cyanide Studios, a French developer, picked up the license to make Blood Bowl video games via their then-publisher Focus Home Interactive, who handles a lot of game releases using Games Workshop licenses, and released the first Blood Bowl game in 2008, with a Legendary Edition following one year later in 2009, and a Chaos Edition after that in 2011. Blood Bowl 2 was released four years later in 2015, still published via Focus Home Interactive. Things changed when it came to Blood Bowl 3, however. Cyanide Studios still handled development, of course, but they had been acquired by Nacon in 2018. Whether or not this change in publisher negatively influenced the development cycle for Blood Bowl 3 and resulted in the state it launched in feeling so... incomplete can only be speculated about. 
I'll justify my thoughts on this more later, but for now I'll say that I do believe Nikon's influence may have negatively affected the game and the state it eventually released in. What can be stated is that Nikon's catalogue of published games varies wildly in quality, with most leaning on the, let's say, mid or lesser side, in my opinion. There are some standout games like Robocop Rogue City and Chaos Bane, the latter of which is another Games Workshop licensed product, by the way. But that's mixed into a pile of a lot of trash and middling games like Gangs of Sherwood and other mediocre at best games obtained via their company's acquisitions. So, to recap, Blood Bowl is a popular miniature game that's been around since the late 80s and the resurgence of interest in it with the launch of its second season in 2020 got more people, including myself, playing Blood Bowl 2 again. It always had a dedicated fan base too, of course, but these things combined start to build hype for a third game in the series. The game was eventually delayed by a whole year, but before we get to that and its actual launch, we need to talk about the first taste of Blood Bowl 3 that the public, including me, got, which was in the form of a rather disastrous closed beta. Hi everyone, we at Nacon and Cyanide Studio announced Blood Bowl 3 last year and it is now time to give you a chance to get your hands on the game for the very first time, including a first look and reveal of the Elven Union team and gameplay. To praise the Chaos Gods, we've decided to give you an opportunity to try a beta version of the game on Steam. To access it, you just need to register on the official website. Once it's your turn to enter the pitch, you'll get an email with a Steam code to use. I'm sure there was probably far earlier tests for beta builds or closed alpha builds for Blood Bowl 3, but as far as I can tell, the first one that the public was allowed into took place on the second week of June 2022. It had six of the 12 teams the full game would eventually launch with playable and would end up being so poorly received that the game would be delayed by a whole year. It's worth noting that as part of cross-platform promotion with an event that Games Workshop runs, two of the featured teams in the closed beta were brand new reworks of teams featured in the starter box for the second season of the miniature game, Black Orcs and Imperial Nobility. The second season starter box also included a code to guarantee your access into this closed beta, and this was how I got in since I purchased the new edition of the miniature game. The original estimation for when the closed beta would take place, by the way, was early 2021. They missed that target by quite a bit. For what I'm going to talk about, I think it's important to see the difference in especially the user interface going forwards. Thus far, you've just been seeing me play the current build of Blood Bowl 3 in the background, recorded just a few days ago. I'm going to play you a little more from the original trailer for the closed beta, and I want you to pay close attention to all elements of the UI. The private beta version is of course still a development version of the game, meaning not everything is final and not all content will be available, but for the occasion of Warhammer Skulls, we want to give you a chance to try the two brand new teams from the latest edition of the board game, the Black Orcs and the Imperial Nobility. And to remind you that dodging and passing is also a viable playstyle, the Elven Union will also be featured for the first time. In the beta, you will be able to create your roster, have a first go with team customization, play versus the AI, and of course, compete against each other in local or online through a classic matchmaking system. For those familiar with Blood Bowl 2, you'll already find new features with a faithful implementation of the board game's new rules, like the addition of the passing ability and the possibility to jump over prone players. You'll also discover exciting match improvements like a new timer format featuring a bonus time pool, more dice display, clearer skills icons, a more streamlined way to declare critical action or plan complex moves. Numerous great improvements have been made, cool elements added, and so much more than we have time to add, so you'll have to see it for yourself. When does the beta start? It starts now with the Warhammer Skulls Festival. Grace yourself and prepare your offerings to Nuffle. Now is the time. See you on the field, coach. Now this might be hard to fully translate to anyone utterly unfamiliar with Blood Bowl's rule set, just how bad this UI is. I'm going to give it a go though. Dice rolls decide everything that happens in the game, be it a d6 deciding if you pick up the ball or a d8 to scatter it, to a special d6 with icons like pow or stumble on them related to the game's mechanics for when one player throws a block at another on the opposing team. Trying to work your way around the closed beta's UI 
to integrate rules that influence the outcome of actions such as sidestep or dodge was confusing to say the least. It was utterly unintuitive and indicative of a change that wasn't really needed since the interface within Blood Bowl 2 was pretty decent. Not perfect, but pretty okay. It was cumbersome to the point that made it frustrating to interact with, but believe it or not, that was just one of many problems. For those that tried out AI matches, they found the enemy AI lacking, let's say, making not only foolish moves, but sometimes just utterly getting stalled trying to decide what to do for minutes on end. Another major problem faced by the closed beta was just how unfinished and rough around the edges everything felt, compounded by the UI being trash, the AI being stupid, the online Gabon and barely functioning. I tried to play exactly two matches of that closed beta against a friend of mine. I think we made it to the tail end of the first half in the first match we tried before the game crashed, and then a few turns at best into our second match before one of us lost connection to the servers. It was clear the game was nowhere close to ready for public consumption, and as a result, I gave up on the closed beta completely. These types of things are usually to get feedback, build hype, and generally get a good feel for how your game is received by the public, while you still have the time to fix little things. Promises were made in the blowback of the closed beta that the UI would be looked at, stability would be improved, and things would just generally be made better. I do want to make it clear that the fundamentals of Blood Bowl's new second season were there even at that stage. The core of the game and the general style were not the issues. There was a perfectly working Blood Bowl 2 looming behind this poorly received beta that just had people thinking, why would I be hyped for this when I have that? Fixing all those things I mentioned moments ago before the planned release date was basically impossible. The task was too large and so the game faced a rather lengthy delay on top of already missing estimates. Let's chat about that. This will probably be a relatively small section, but as we chart the course that the game has followed, I do think it's important to note that by the time the already late close beta arrived, the project itself was massively behind schedule. I suspect Nikon tugged tightly on the purse strings around this time and basically said, I don't care, get this out the door ASAP. Facing a massive backlash from fans regarding the stability, quality and UI issues the closed beta face that I just talked about, Cyanide Studios opted to miss the game's original release date of February 2022 by a whole year. You might be thinking, things need as long as they need, right? And I do agree. If that's how long is needed to make it good, then so be it. As many fans were quick to point out, there was always Blood Bowl 2 to play, which had a full roster of teams and a healthy, long-living player base. While there might be exceptions of games getting stuck in development cycle hell or self-indulgent hyper-focus like I feel the sequel to Hollow Knight might be in right now, taking a bit of extra time can help a game. They'd been given enough player feedback, even if mostly negative, to work from, but time and, presumably more importantly, money always seem to be against them. Sometimes all you need is a bit of time, but sometimes time isn't even enough to save a game. Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League faced multiple delays and was still awful, whereas Gotham Knights took a little bit of time to try and strip as much of the games as a service model out and made it, well, passable. The point I'm trying to make is that if you need time to make something good, then that is fine. Take the time. At least try to do it right in the best way you can. Despite pressure I'm sure was coming down at them from the publisher, Cyanide Studios took an entire year of extra development time, so surely when the launch did eventually happen on February 23rd, 2023, it was great. Right? Right? Jeez, where do we even start? I guess we should start with this. The launch in February 2023 for Blood Bowl 3 was so horrifically bad that I didn't even buy the game. Not only didn't I buy the game, but I actively tracked how poorly it was doing for some shameful joy at watching something I was looking forward to that turned out so bad, crashing and burning so spectacularly. I feel a little bad about that now looking back. 
By the way, the Switch version they mentioned in the clip I showed still doesn't exist, apparently because of issues rescaling the UI onto the Switch screen, which I'm not sure I entirely believe. Retailers are still taking pre-orders on the Switch version of Blood Bowl 3 though, and a to-be-confirmed release date is slated for some time in 2024. So what kind of problems existed at launch for Blood Bowl 3? Well, this is going to take a while. The server's barely functioning and a game pushing its online competitive nature would probably be up there as number one. I think it had some offline capabilities, but very bare bones. If you could log in, you might get a game, but matches can take at least an hour and disconnects were very frequent. There was no ability to reconnect to a match, which would then issue a concede to you, which also meant you got a penalty, which, if you collected enough of, would ban you from online play for up to seven days. Features previously available for free in Blood Bowl 2, like team customization now being locked behind a paywall of microtransactions and premium currency, also turned people off, as did the news of each season having a battle pass. The 12 team representation being so limited compared to Blood Bowl 2 was another point raised by many, though I don't fully side with them on that, as we'll talk about later. Bob and Jim, the well known ogre and vampire commentators from Blood Bowl, returned, but most of their lines were reused from Blood Bowl 2 and what new interactions there were seemed immensely limited as they repeated very frequently. They must have had the actors in the recording booth for an hour at best. The intro to the game also reuses the intro to the main menu from Blood Bowl 2 but blurred it out and put it in the background. Then we have some much more game versus tabletop specific complaints like failure to apply certain rules correctly, not adapting to recent errata or FAQ clarifications regarding the rules, and finally some little features missing like player mutations not being visibly represented on their in-game model, and in-game character models in general not looking like they looked in Blood Bowl 2. If you've played or seen enough video games in your life, you can just sort of tell when something is just a little off and unfinished. You get a second sense for this kind of thing. Even if the Blood Bowl 3 servers hadn't crapped the bed or the disconnect bug with no way to rejoin hadn't been a thing, there was still a general unfinished feel to what was presented to everyone. It was a three course meal with bite marks in the first two and an empty plate for the third. Something wasn't quite right. How could a game so delayed still have so many issues? They really wanted to push the online competitive game against other humans, apparently, yet the online functionality barely, well, functioned. This is where we have to start separating problems the game had at launch with the plan the developers had for it. The game launched with a pre-season, meaning seasonal content they had plotted out wouldn't be available at launch. This piled on people's beliefs that the game was unfinished, but in this instance, I don't believe that to be true. In watching lots of interviews with the developers, their ideas for seasonal content seemed pretty planned out in advance. Note that that doesn't mean I agree with or think it's a good thing. They saw this pre-season period as a chance for new people to learn the game and decide on the team they'd want to run in official competitions or the seasonal ladder. Blood Bowl 3 is the most ambitious game in the series and its release is just the start of the adventure. One of our goals is for you to play Blood Bowl 3 for many years to come. That's why, after the game's releases, a dedicated team will continue to work on the game to improve its stability and fix any technical issues that may arise. This team will also create new content, add new factions, cosmetics items and features, and support the competitive aspect of the game. We were willing to delay the game's release to meet our quality expectations, and these high standards will continue to guide our vision after launch. We wanted to improve via things that many of the community had feedback on with Blood Bowl 2, including how new factions were acquired after launch. In Blood Bowl 3, it will all be based on a season system. There will be a new season every three months, coming with a major update that will add a wide variety of content and features, as well as introducing a new faction, which will be added to the 12 already present at launch, and a new Blood Pass. The Blood Pass consists of 50 reward tiers that you move up through as you play matches. At certain tiers, you unlock free rewards. You can also choose the paid version of the Blood Pass to instantly acquire the new faction and gain access to lots of additional rewards that can be unlocked at each tier. We wanted to implement a system that is more rewarding for you than the DLC system was in Blood Bowl 2. That's why Blood Bowl 3 will be cheaper than Blood Bowl 2 on its release, 
on the Blue Pass, we'll have lots of content with a variety of rewards to customize your teams and players. We also wanted to allow everyone to enjoy the new faction. Even without upgrading your Blue Pass to the paid version, you can still acquire the new faction for free by reaching the last tier during the current season. Unfortunately, with the game feeling bare bones and with barely functioning servers, their plans for a pre-season leading into Season 1 came across as for nefarious reasons that I honestly don't think existed. This was then made worse when Season 1 was further delayed to give them time to try and fix the game's servers and add some much needed quality of life improvements. I mentioned the microtransactions, so I think we need to take a look at those next. Before we go on, I did mention that I never bought Blood Bowl 3 at launch, so for perspective I should make it clear right now that I picked up the game not that far into the launch of its Season 4. That means I missed all the launch issues, but more importantly for what we're talking about right now, I missed the first three seasons of Premium Battle Passes with associated new teams in each. I believe they did make the Lizardmen, who were the new team added with Season 1, free to all players to try and appease them for the initial disastrous launch, but that was not applicable to me. Blood Bowl 3 is monetized in quite a few different ways, so let's start with the four versions of Blood Bowl 3 that still to this day exist on Steam. You've got the base version of the game, you've got the Black Orc edition of the game, you've got the Imperial Nobility edition, and finally you have the Brutal edition. At the time of making this video, that means the price range of the different versions range from £25 to £41. I should mention I actually got a key for the Brutal edition of the game from a less than reputable retailer for less than £10. It pays to look around. I think the Brutal edition of the game came with some additional cosmetics that I haven't really looked into. Making individual players have different styles of helmets or whatever has no value to me. While it seems to have annoyed some players that in-game models now more closely match their physical real-life versions available from their tabletop game, I personally love that and don't feel the need to customise beyond that because at a glance I know, oh, that's a Blitzer, that's a Rotter, that's a Ghoul, and so on. Here's some comparisons between in-game teams and their real-life counterparts. Please excuse my paint jobs on them, but you'll get the general idea. The in-game models now very closely match the real thing. For anything you want to buy in the game, you'll need Warpstone. The edition of the game I got gave me 1,000 of this for free, which I used to pick up a team I'd missed. Here you can see what various Warpstone amounts cost in Euros. If you do want some customization options for your players, the current season battle pass is full of them for a start, but for ones you've missed in previous seasons, they seem to range from 75 Warpstone to 750 in the store, and that's very roughly speaking between 1 Euro and 6 Euros. I'm not working it out specifically, God, I hate pretend in-game premium currency trying to mask real costs and offering odd amounts so you'll get just enough for the thing you want, but maybe you have some left over to encourage getting more. Different cheerleaders cost around 500, and fancy-looking themed dice cost around 250. Teams you've missed by not playing in previous seasons cost 750 Warpstone. They also offer larger... deals with up to 98 custom options and special looking balls and dice for as much as 2,500 warp stone. But wait! There's more! The current season battle pass, which it calls a blood pass, costs 1,000 warp stone, or 2,000 if you want the first 20 tiers unlocked instantly. Buying the season's blood pass gives you immediate access to that season's new team, so in this case it would be the wood elves. Now to be fair, there is a way to get the new season's team for free. Well, I say for free, but it costs you something far more important than money, and that's your time. If you max out the Blood Pass to level 50, whether you bought it or not, you're given access to the new team and their star player. This requires a lot of playing the game. As I mentioned, I joined early into the 3 month run for Season 4, and at the time of making this video I've played the season for 10 hours and made it to only level 8 in the Blood Pass. I should probably say something meaningful to all our Cabal Vision viewers. Think of this. Splat. I should point out that there is nothing here that could be considered pay to win except perhaps the teams that I'll get to in a moment. Different looking players or having fancy cheerleaders or dice makes literally no difference to how you play or how lucky you are while you play. These things are, in the truest sense, purely cosmetic. The slightly grey area is the teams. 
Most of what's going to be added soon was leaked ahead of time during the launch of the game. People sick to the sight of over-monetized games looked into the files at launch and found some work-in-progress versions of teams that at launch hadn't even been spoken about, let alone released. One of the teams is a personal favourite of mine that I think is going to be released in Season 5 or 6, called the Necromantic Horror Team. This doesn't mean they were feature ready, though. People were angry the game didn't launch with the full roster. Blood Bowl 2 didn't either, but players had grown accustomed to having so many available teams, and with Blood Bowl 3 only having 12 originally, and now 16, they were upset. They also seemed to ignore that the teams were being redesigned to match the miniatures on the tabletop, and whether or not you like that, it doesn't mean it's easy or free to do. The developers want and need more income down the line, and I'm with you if you hate premium currency cosmetic shops like this game has, but you can't then also complain that additional teams have to be paid for. It was always like that. What you absolutely can complain about though is that previous teams cost 750 warp stone, which falls between the 500 and 1050 amounts available for purchase. That kind of deliberate insidious shit is not okay. I mentioned the teams being a potential problem pay to win wise, so I better explain myself. The teams in Blood Bowl have a tier rating. Generally, there are some teams that just will not have a decent chance of winning and some that are really quite easy to win with. Now this isn't always a bad thing, generally if you find someone who loves playing as halflings or snotlings, both of these teams are currently unavailable by the way, but they might be added down the line, you'll find they don't really care if they lose or that half of their players are likely to be dead by the end of match 4, it's all just a fun meme for them, but the team isn't designed to be winning all their matches. It can also be enticing as a challenge to try and do well with a team like that that's specifically built just not to be as good as the others. Conversely though, some teams are just very powerful, and since Blood Bowl 3 tries very hard to perfectly replicate the tabletop version and its rule set, this applies here too. While I'm not pretending to be any kind of authority on what is or isn't OP for Blood Bowl, I just play for fun. Crazy, I know. I think so far they've been able to avoid this by the seasonal teams they've added being middling to decent at best. Things could change going forwards though, like I said, I'm really curious how a season pushing a halfling team would do compared to a season pushing, say, a corn team, for instance. The buy-in for just picking up the game has come down from launch and is usually at least half price in major Steam sales. While the in-game monetization is something I'd rather not see outside of how to obtain new teams, I didn't find it hard to ignore. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make here. Who cares what an armband looks like that your lineman has on? The developers themselves defended their monetization model as fair, so it doesn't seem like the publisher interfered at all here. For better or worse, it is as they wanted, so take from that what you will. Oh, this is bloody weird, right? I know, how the hell is there a chapter on story in a game like Blood Bowl 3? Well, would it surprise you to know that this game not only had one, but two campaign writers? One of the two, who was also the lead cinematic artist, did an interview about it. Now, if you've played the game, your reaction is probably, really? Since you've seen the campaign. Here's how it is described by one of the two people responsible for making it. Hello, my name is Johan Druder. I'm lead cinematic artist at Cyanide and also co-wrote the Blood Bowl 3 campaign. Blood Bowl is a turn-based tactical game inspired by American football set in the Warhammer fantasy world. The game is spectacular, brutal and full of humour and parody. The important thing about Blood Bowl 3 is that we've adapted the new board game edition. We implemented its new rules so the gameplay is impacted. Yeah, he, he takes a little bit to actually talk about the plot and mostly instead talks about the rules they're incorporating from the second season tabletop game version. Give him a second. From a graphic standpoint, it also means that all our models are true to those in that edition. Quite a few of the new game mechanics are coming straight from the board game. I'm sure you'll like them. He does talk about the story soon, I promise. Most pitches have rules which can change the outcome of a game. Besides, some pitches can transform themselves during a match if specific requirements are met. For instance, on the Dark Elf pitch, if you score a touchdown in the first half, a Kraken appears and the match obviously becomes way tougher. There is also the Elven Union pitch. Whenever there's a climate change, a magical wind can be cast on the field, freezing it in the process and making it slippery for your players when they move. Then there are the special play cards. They are cards you can play during a match and they give you access to certain abilities. For example, a loud blitz, 
allows you to blitz twice during a turn. Blood Bowl players know how useful that can be. I know these special play cards from the physical version. Are these cards in Blood Bowl 3? I don't think they're in Blood Bowl 3. There is also white stuff, which can give the block skill to a player who has three strength or less. Then there are also prayers to Nuffle. These are effects that take place right after the inducement phase, and they help bringing back balance on the battlefield. For example, Enter Scrutiny prevents the referee from seeing one side of the pitch. Quite convenient if you want to cheat. There is also Treacherous Trapdoor, which spawns bear traps on the field. As you could see in the trailer, the campaign is built around the theme of sponsors. There are several competitions, each of which is thematically linked to a sponsor. During the campaign, you will have to face a bunch of star players, who are the public faces of these sponsors. They are both very strong and charismatic. Rejoice, Blood Bowl aficionados, Farrakh Gulchua is back. He's an orc star player and a brutal and vicious one at that. In the campaign, he created a gym chain with the Orchidus brand, whose methods are rather unconventional. One of the star players I like the most is Kirioth Krakenai. He's a dark elf corsair who started in cruising company called Corsair Cruises and it allows him to hide the fact he's actually a slave of pirates. We decided to base the campaign on fake sponsors and star players for gameplay related reasons. We wanted players to create their own teams from any race. I'm not sure what he meant by this statement. There are teams that combine units from other teams such as underworld denizens, but you can't just throw, say, some Nurgle dudes with lizardmen or anything like that. You've never been able to do anything like that. Each competition is linked to their sponsor through a strong theme, and that is how we pick the teams you are going to face. For instance, during the Corsair Cruises competition, you'll be facing all those aboard Kirioth Krakenai ships, beginning with the rats in the ship's holds, and then with the unfortunate souls Kirioth enslaved, and finally Kirioth Krakenai's very own team, the Blackheart Corsairs. This narrative choice gives lots of room for humour and parody, both being quintessential aspects of the Blood Bowl licence. Each sponsor has their own parody ad spot. Our idea was to parody and play around with the ads that air during the Super Bowl in the United States. I also drew a lot of inspiration from Blood Bowl's very own community, which has always been creating hilarious parodies. Of course, Jim and Bob are back to commentate matches, and during the campaign, they'll be paired up with a few guests who'll pitch in for the occasion. Jim and Bob are never joined in the commentator booth at any point, but that's not that important. It was a great pleasure to show you our work. I can't wait for you guys to check out Blood Bowl 3. To be fair, the parody Super Bowl ads that play before you take on each sponsor competition are genuinely great. They're very well made, they're funny. So funny I felt one was good enough to open the video with. Here's another. Looks like that dwarf is stuck in the middle of the greenskins. His teammates are either unconscious or most likely dead. What he needs, Bob, is a miracle. Wait. You hear that? That's the sound of Bugman XXXXXX. Probably the best beer in the old world. Ha! Come and get it, lad! Look at those little legs go! I've never seen a dwarf run that fast. Beer of the Mountain Kings. As good as these are, that's really all there is to any story the game has. After the short intro cutscene and tutorials, you get to tackle six mini leagues with a team of your choice. The goal in each is to defeat each of the major sponsors via their star player that endorses them, and then that's really it. In terms of the writing, you could bang it out in an afternoon. These parody ads and some unique lines of dialogue from Bob and Jim do not a story make. I guess they've had to account for you using any team, but you take the role of the coach, so that's very easy to play into. The focus for Cyanide Studios was for sure the competitive portion of the game, player versus player. For many, including myself, this was quite disappointing. Not that Blood Bowl 2's Reichland Reavers campaign was especially memorable, but this was a chance to do something with a bit more depth, and they just didn't. They really wanted Blood Bowl 3 to be the next big competitive sports game, and come hell or high water, they were never, ever going to deviate from that goal.
With Blood Bowl 3's disastrous launch, delayed first season and general lack of polish, it was no surprise that the game did very, very poorly. A quick look at some information about recent player numbers is more than enough of an indication that the game is not in a healthy place. To their credit, however, Cyanide Studios have not abandoned their game one year on and are still pushing forwards with their plans. Here we can see the original year one plans for Blood Bowl 3. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, shouldn't half of this been in here since launch? Yeah, yep, yep, yeah, I, I totally agree. But take it for what it is. They had this plan, they stuck to it. Now here's their plan for 2024, and while there are slight delays, and I personally think it's ridiculous that Eternal Leagues won't be in until the end of the year, it is all still clearly stating their goals for the months ahead. Despite being largely forgotten and not having a huge player base, it is still facing blowback from fans to this day. The developers even still reply to certain negative reviews, although from what I've seen in my research, all the recent replies are slight variations of the same generic responses, I'm putting one of them on the screen for you now. One specific thing caught my attention while I was doing research for this video, though. There's an interesting debate in the game's community at present about conceding from a match. You can't do it currently, so even if you've lost for sure and your players are literally being beaten to death, the only way to say, I quit, is to ult F4. This grants you the concede, the opponent gets a victory, and it starts building up that penalty for you that I mentioned earlier on that might see you banned from competitive games for up to seven days. Remember that this game's focus is the competitive ladders for each season. So you might be wondering, why is it this way? Well, the reason it's this way is because, and we're getting into some rules minutia here again a bit, but I'll be as brief as I can, I promise. Players gain star player points, or SPP, for doing certain things in a match, like killing an opposing player, completing a pass, scoring a touchdown, and so on. You can think of it like XP for individual players. If you concede early, you're denying your opponent the chance to earn more SPP to improve their players before their next match. But, as people have rightly pointed out, it isn't any fun to play a full match you know you've lost, especially if your opponent is just hiding the ball in their back line so they can batter your players into bloody smears on the grass. The tabletop version's rules for players knowingly running out the clock in this way are iffy to be as polite as possible in their application and usefulness. So this comes down to a playability versus practicality argument. A friend of mine felt the compromise to keep both sides happy would be to grant the ability to concede but let the AI take over for your team so the opponent can play out the game if they wish. Not ideal, but it's certainly something that would go some way to appeasing both sides of the argument. This is a problem that exists due to the nature of the rules of the game and how strictly Cyanide Studios have stuck to them, but as the roadmaps I showed you a few minutes ago pointed out, not only are they still sticking to their guns, but they are actively trying to implement all the rule changes and erratas that Games Workshop has issued to the tabletop version of Blood Bowl. They have a vision for their game and truly want it to be a digitised version of the real thing. That's fairly unique for a Games Workshop licensed product, by the way. Most aren't allowed to accurately replicate the physical game it's taken from this closely because of a fear that they'll lose out on miniature sales. I don't think there's any denying that this perfect replica is Cyanide's end goal, and I think that's what surprised me the most as I researched the developers of the game and, of course, finally played it for myself. We've come this far and I haven't really talked about my own experience playing the full version of Blood Bowl 3 yet and that's because I wanted to provide a little context. Well, okay, a lot of context before I got to that because the conclusion I reached with my time with Blood Bowl 3, albeit somewhat limited so far, is not the one I thought I would have had when I decided to buy it in order to make this video. Now, here at the end, the penultimate chapter, I'm ready to start talking about it. I like Blood Bowl 3 quite a bit. Oh, so, forming an angry mob, eh? Who are we going after? Oh, hey! Ah, put down the pitchforks. I'm not saying it launched in an acceptable state, okay? It did not. It absolutely did not. Put them away. That's why I didn't buy it. That's why most people didn't buy it. And those that did reviewed it negatively and then refunded it, as they should have. It launched in a pathetic, appalling state. The writing was very much on the wall for the sorry state it was in. But here we are four seasons deep and just over a year later since it was shot out into the public eye and things are honestly a lot better. 
For a start, the game works. I didn't run into any issues in that regard, but that's just the start. With the in-game character models now matching the contemporary miniatures and the graphical engine getting a much needed improvement, it feels very like the real thing, just without the tedious parts sometimes connected to playing the real thing. The real life version of Blood Bowl can take a while with checking of rules, and the setup and the teardown, all that stuff. It can be so long to play, the Games Workshop even created a smaller, shorter version of it called Sevens that personally I think is the better way to play Blood Bowl for the record. It's nice to have an updated Blood Bowl to play that follows the more up-to-date rule set from the second season edition of The Real Thing. This does come at a cost in terms of reduced available teams at present, but I don't really have a big problem with them re-releasing them over time. The problem they had to solve was making the game work right. Simple as that. And it's at a point now where I feel I can say that it does work. Now there are some things that still bother me, so don't think I've gone soft. The UI is still not perfect. The AI will carry on playing while you're trying to read kickoff results and see how a dice roll went elsewhere, for example. You have to hear the same four or five reactions from Bob and Jim over and over, like the story about the Nurgling and the Greater Unclean one. And yeah, the AI in general is still pretty terrible with the decision making it puts on display. Also, trying to play a league even just against AI teams is a bit of a mess with the UI and change of terms that do not reflect how the tabletop game handles leagues. In Blood Bowl 3 you make a league, but then within a league you can have multiple competitions and it is these competitions where you register individual teams that serve the function that leagues served in Blood Bowl 2. Very confusing. I actually had to google how to make an AI filled league to try out a team outside of a single friendly match where there would be no SPP gain and no progression. I wish I could have made a more pointed argument for why the game is decent now beyond, well, it's Blood Bowl and it works now. But is any more than that really needed? If you've fully written off Cyanide Studios for the state the game launched in and the fact it is in a better place now won't change that, then fair enough. Or you could be like this person in the Steam Community Hub who say they've been gaming for 58 years. It's certainly an opinion. Yep. Quite, uh, quite the word salad. You know at one point he even mentions there being a dice algorithm or sequence of patterns and I'm kind of with him on that. I believe it isn't true random always, but I always felt that about Blood Bowl 2 as well, so... It either isn't a new thing, or it's just the human condition to spot patterns in things where they don't necessarily exist, especially when they seem to lean towards screwing you over. Some people will never be happy with the game. Sometimes that's me, I've been there. In this case though, I waited long enough to try Blood Bowl 3 since it's embarrassing launch that it is in a state I can be happy with for the price I paid for it. I don't feel the need to grind to unlock the Wood Elves and I might even buy access to the Necromantic Horror Team when they get added since their new aesthetic in the tabletop game is absolutely fantastic. Now if you don't care about the new rules or graphics and want every team available for the game barring any that have been made or updated for the second season of the tabletop game, then for two or three pounds more you can get the legendary edition of Blood Bowl 2 that has everything. If you still have grievances with Blood Bowl 3 but want a decent enough digitized version of the tabletop game, Blood Bowl 2 will still get the job done, I'm not arguing that it won't. All I'm saying is that if you wrote Blood Bowl 3 off at launch and have never looked back at it again since then, it might be worth at least just a little glance. And that is a recommendation I never knew I was going to make before I started playing it. It's been a bit of a journey with Blood Bowl 3, a game I was ready to rip into because I was there for his launch watching every painful thing unfold, watching everything fail. I watched the negative reviews pile up, the poor player count drop lower and lower. It shamefully became a thing my friends and I laughed at. Like I mentioned, Cyanide Studios has a plan and they are sticking to it. In the research I've done, they come across like they mean well and want what's best for their gaming community and they are sticking with it, trying to make it work. While I don't fully agree with their approach, especially to monetization or priorities, it was refreshing to see the dedication they have to their game, especially when compared to recent examples like Rocksteady. Being cynical on the internet is exceptionally easy to do. I do it, you do it, we all do it. We're naturally skeptical and cynical about most things we see on the internet. It's healthy to be that way a lot of the time. That's what makes it hard to spot genuine effort or a desire to change. 
I could be wrong, of course. Maybe I've read it all wrong and they're just trying to bleed every last penny they can out of a failed project. But it hasn't come across like that to me. If you want to see phony, then watch Rocksteady's update videos about Suicide Squad. That's phony. If you're still happy just playing Blood Bowl 2, that's fine. It's a safe bet and it doesn't cost that much more. Fine. If you're willing to give it a chance though, or are a new player and have become interested in what you've seen in this video, giving Blood Bowl 3 a teeny tiny chance might just be worth it. You could even wait for the next Steam sale if you want an absolute bargain. Fine. With that surprising recommendation from me over with, despite my little list of issues I have with the game, I think that about does it for everything I wanted to say about Blood Bowl 3. At least for now. If down the line, in future seasons, it shits the bed again or crashes and burns completely and the company turns out to be greedy and evil, sure, fine, I'll make an update on that, I'll apologise, I read it entirely wrong. For now though, take it at face value. I've played some Blood Bowl 3 and I enjoyed it. With that said, I'll say thanks for watching, please remember to like and subscribe for future video essay content, and until next time, ta, -ta for now. So what are your closing thoughts?